Welcome to part six. As if the previous data that we looked at with unreliable translation choices, errors, dubious associations, as if all of that wasn't enough, there's more. Of course, a lot of KJV onlyists like to use numer numerological proofs that the KJV is this divine work of God and basically it's verbally inspired and to prove the legitimacy of their translation over other translations. Today we're going to show you from many perspectives why all of these things are wrong. And not only that, but it's harlotry, idolatry, and divination. Why do I say these three specific things? Well, it's harlotry because remember, KGV onlyism as a movement is a daughter of Rome, spiritually. It's its own denomination with its own prophet. And it claims special favor from God and special revelation and so on, all the things we've mentioned before. It's idolatry because you're elevating the work of man to a divine work, something special that needs to be put on a pedestal, and venerating a created thing, which is a translation, which again has errors in it, as we clearly saw. And of course, the last part, which is very important, is that all of these numerological proofs are divination. They, they fall into the ca category of divination. When you're dealing with numerology and discerning the meaning from numbers and looking at patterns in in texts and trying to find secret knowledge and things like that. This is all prohibited by the Bible, folks. There's nothing new under the sun, and again, we'll prove it to you today, hopefully, if you have an open mind. Another important point is that this is not, that's, this is not something that's special to the KJV. There are many people who claim to find important patterns in texts as proof of their legitimacy, and again, I will prove that to you today as well. Plus, remember our good old occult friend, Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon, who is a Rosicrucian, Freemason, who knows what he was. Obviously, he's very esteemed by the occult people, very influential in moving along the Freemason agenda and the constitution of the Freemasons, putting his ciphers in various places and various works, Shakespeare, and of course, the King James Bible. What's to say? that all of those numerological proofs, or I should say even some of them, because statistically it's not impossible to find patterns of numbers in any given text, especially something as long as the Bible, that is, I don't know, 700,000 plus words, which is an enormous amount of content. That's a lot of words. So the, st the statistical probability of finding patterns is very high. But has anybody bothered to consider what part of those patterns, given the evidence that we looked at with Psalm 46 and other things like where he's putting ciphers and various works and things like that to identify himself and to, you know, kind of wink to his occult friends. Who is to say what part of these numerological significances weren't actually designed by Francis Bacon? Who's to say now that we have evidence that he's done such a thing? So these are things to keep in mind as you go along, folks. Harlotry, idolatry, divination. It's not unique to the KJV. And we have evidence that part of these numerological co uh, coincidences are very likely designed by an occultist. So keep that in mind. A lot of KJV only onlyists will say, well, the impact of the KJV is undeniable. You can't question that. It, it's proof that God basically anointed this book. Well, the impact is because God uses all things for the good. All the wicked things of history that the devil creates counterfeits with or tries to attack the word of God, God flips it. Remember, the devil's the pitcher. God tells him exactly how to throw the ball so he can throw, so he can uh, hit home runs every single time. This is the relationship between God and the devil. It's not, the impact of the KGV is not because God has cho chosen this particular translation and anointed it to be above all other translations. The impact of the KJV is because God chose to use it in a particular way. Did God choose to use the KJV translation for his purposes? Yes, obviously. KJV has had massive impact. The enemy has also used it for massive impact. But nevertheless, God has used it to reach the elect and to touch their hearts and to move forward the process of analyzing Bible translations, 
uh, creating personal Bibles, and so on and so forth. So God has definitely used it for his purpose. Many have gotten saved because of the KJV and personal Bibles in general, obviously. The word has gone out through all of creation, just as the Bible prophesied. And a big part of that was the KJV and, and printing Bibles and the movement that basically started with the Reformation. Absolutely. But it's not exclusively the KJV. So we have to also distinguish there as well. But all the glory goes to God, not to a particular translation. This is, again, why this is idolatry. If you think that the KJV is just a stellar translation because the KJV this, KJV that, you're putting your attention and focus and the ultimate end is on a physical work of man rather than seeing the greater picture because the KJV is, the, is not the only translation that happened. And also the KJV didn't, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It didn't just suddenly appear. It took from previous translations that God also used and built on top of them and other translations built on top of the KJV. And remember, there were a thousand editions printed between 1611 and 1769 that needed corrections. So there's that as well. So keep all this in mind, folks, because this is going to be very important. If anything, the actual train of thought goes something like this. God judged the Byzantine Empire with the Ottoman Empire. And of course, that's prophesied in the book of Revelation. These things forced manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, to go into the West. And as a result, it disrupted the beast's control over the world. Meanwhile, you also had on the other side, the Reformation. Pilgrims started leaving Europe and going to America. A lot of things started disrupting the beast's hold over the world. And that was by design. Of course, the beast was allowed to live until the very end because it needs to come into power to separate God's elect from the counterfeits. But nevertheless, the beast's control was disrupted. You had the Reformation, the printing press, the Ottoman Empire. All these things simultaneously made the perfect storm to basically shake things up. And of course, Satan wasn't going to just sit around, so he responded with the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits, learning against learning, the theaters, you know, things like Shakespeare, counterfeit uh, infiltrators attacking Protestants with tradition, both on, on many sides. Sunday Keeping, Texas Receptus, Immortality of the Soul, uh, everything possible, waging all-out war against the truth. And again, all these things are designed for God to be glorified. God used all of these evil things and evil efforts and flipped them every time, flip, 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 to reveal his glory and his purpose and his sovereignty over time and space, and of course, his provision for the elect. The King James Version is a work of man that God used for the good. That is the correct way to think about it. Dot, dot, dot. Some more things to add to that. The King James Version is a work of man that God used for the good, just like other translations that he uses for the good. He uses all things to reveal his glory. It's not the King James Version is the only translation that God has used for the good, and the other ones are just corrupt. They're, they're immune from God's influence, if you think about it. That's the argument, is really that all these translations, God is just, you just let them just happen, no control over it whatsoever, which of course is not true. Now, let's talk about this numerology stuff. There's a lot of numerological proofs, and I'm not really going to go exhaustively into all of them. I'm just going to recite to you some things that I've seen, and there are so many of these, but the point is to see why these are wrong. But I'm going to give you some of the proofs that people bring up, and, and so you can see the train of thought that guides this type of thinking. Don't let these coincidences that I'm about to share with you, and you can write them down if you want, I mean, either way, but don't let them get to you. There's an intelligent, rational, perfectly common sense explanation for why these things happen, even though it may seem at first glance that these are very impressive and unique and ooh, dazzling. Do not be fooled by the lust of the eyes. So, God the Father's name, Jehovah, is mentioned exactly seven times in the King James Bible. And it's in Exodus, uh, Exodus Genesis, Judges, Psalms, Isaiah, Isaiah. Jesus is the Word of God. Word, capitalized, is mentioned seven times in the King James Bible. And again, there's verses here. I'm going to, they will be just for the sake of brevity, because it doesn't matter in the end. It really doesn't. You can look these up for yourself. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of people who have numerological proofs of the KJV. But I will put these in the presentation notes. 
I'm just going to read them off, and if you want to double check the verses for yourself, they will be in the presentation notes to this presentation, which is available in the folder in the library of this particular uh, presentation. So Jesus is the Word of God. Word, capitalized, is mentioned seven times in the King James. Holy Spirit is mentioned seven times in the King James. You also have the Father. The, Word, the Father is mentioned 218 times. The Word is mentioned 469 mentions. Holy Ghost is mentioned 90 times. And if you add all those up, it adds up to 777. Every book of the King, every book of the King James, if you add up all the um, verse text in in the actual books, so the actual amount of words, you have seven hundred eighty nine thousand six hundred twenty nine words. The Psalm superscriptions, i.e., like if you have a Psalm of David or a Psalm of Asaph or things like that, those superscriptions there are a hundred, or I'm sorry, a thousand thirty four words. The Psalm inscriptions i.e. Aleph or, you know, Gimel or whatever else, there's 22. Colophones, i.g. like unto the Colossians written from Rome, 186 words. Words on the cover of the Bible, i.e. the Holy Bible King James Version, 5. Words in book titles, uh, like the book of Joshua, the book of Genesis, so on and so forth, 376 words. Total chapters, chapter 8, that's... Um, 1,189 words. Total verses, uh, 31,102. Grand total, 800,023, 543. 823,543, which is equal to 7 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 7. So there's a lot more like these, okay? People find these types of correlations between words and things like that. And... It seems at first glance that, wow, there's so much harmony and perfection in this information. It must be, therefore, a special thing that God did and intended to do. That is the therefore that you need to avoid and not be seduced by such superficial things. And today, hopefully, we can break that spell. So what's my response? Well, my response is that these things can be very seductive if you don't have discernment. The natural fleshly indication is to go for what's shiny, what looks good, what's harmonious. We tend to idolize creation. We like harmonious things. We like balance. We like, you know, beauty. And if something is beautiful, we think, oh, therefore, that's good. Think about this in advertising, actually. This is a gimmick that's as old as time, folks. You put a, you know, a cute girl there with, with something in her hand, it must be there for a good product. This is the subconscious way that we think about everything. If something is harmonious and beautiful, it therefore must be true and good. When in fact, very important, the Bible warns you that the, the devil appears as an angel of light. It's not the obvious thing that is evil. It's the thing that is almost right. So don't be seduced by your brain and the Genesis curse that it's under because these things are not what they seem. They really aren't. And again, we'll prove it to you today. You will learn why they, they are nothing special. You'll also learn many psychological principles that govern our flesh and that determine how we are likely to respond to things. Which, again, is this is a can of worms, but I'm not going to open it too much. The point is, if you really understand psychology, you realize that you cannot choose free of influence. You can't. And that's the point why you need a savior. You are unable to choose free of influence. If you understand all of the psychological triggers that you're under from a very young age, your behavior is completely predictable. You make choices and you choose what you want to choose in that moment, but that doesn't mean you're choosing free of influence. And if you understand that simple fact, then you realize why the only answer is the gospel and from a monergistic perspective, i.e. God is doing the work, you can trust in his work, you cannot be lost, and all of these things are predestined for God's glory. More on that in a future series as we talk about salvation. Very, very important topic. But today we are talking about this KJV stuff. And the question is this, are you willing to let go of the importance of these things in favor of the truth? Are you willing to let go of these superficial, silly things and base your beliefs more on the rock-solid things that we talked before, on the apologetic arguments, 
how nature proves the existence of God and why the gospel must be true, even without the Bible. Uh, undesigned coincidences, typology, cross-references over 1,500 years, biblical archaeology, Bible prophecy, on and on and on, martyrdom, embarrassing details. That is the rock-solid evidence. 99% variants are meaningless. 1% is not theological, theologically consequential. Those are the rock-solid pillars of why you can trust the Bible and any translation that you have. None of them are perfect, but you can trust that the message is being conveyed. That's the way that you need to do things. Not, oh, my Bible has this pattern in it, and therefore it must be true. Well, obviously, there are errors in your Bible, i.e. KJV. So, it can't be the case. No single apostle, nor Jesus Christ, ever did gematria. That's sorcery. It's divination. They never used numerology or it taught you to basically look for secret patterns in the scriptures. These are things part of rabbinic Judaism, and you'll see it today as well. It's, it's not actually not unique to rabbinic Judaism. It's a mystery religion practice. And because the mystery religion has expressed itself in many forms, you'll see it in a couple different forms today. Now, some people say, well, what about John in 666 in the Mark of the Beast? Well, yeah, John received a vision with symbols. And some of those symbols were numbers. For example, the 144,000. If you watch my end time series, you realize that's not literal people. God is not saving only 144,000 people at the end times. That would be very depressing. 144,000 is a symbol, it's a numerical symbol of completion. 12, i.e. the 12 tribes of Israel, i.e. the church being from all tribes and tongues, completion, times 10, times 10, times 10 right? So you have 10 is a number of completion, 3 to the third power is also a number of completion, of maximal, you know, power, and of course 12 representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles too. So these things are symbolic of God's elect. All of the elect are going to be sealed. You don't have to worry. You do your best and God will do the rest. Share the truth. You don't have to be a perfect Bible scholar. You don't have to know the gospel perfectly. You just have to participate in God's plan and know for certain that God will save everybody who he has chosen to save. Now, some will maybe require a lot of pushing. Some people will need to see their friends or their relatives be taken into prison for not bowing down to this system until they wake up, like the thief on the cross, the last minute. Some people will need to do that. So you need to realize that God has a different timing for everybody. And in his wisdom, he has chosen this to reveal his glory and to conform us to his plan. Those who wake up sooner are invited to participate and also to practice love and tolerance, which is an ongoing practice. But nevertheless, 144,000, which is a number in Revelation, is also symbolic. Now, we also have 666. So what do we do about that? Does that mean that John is telling you, okay, there's a secret cipher in this and you need to do this with this number and do all these numerological guesses? No, not at all. It's a symbolic number, just like 144,000. Six is the number for man and sin, because man was created on the sixth day, imperfection. And it's written three times in a row, meaning the number is maximized. And basically you have sin maximized. So the number of the beast, the beast is the papacy, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, who claims to be God, basically who puts himself in the temple of God and thinks himself to be God. The Pope was called Our Lord God the Pope for many centuries. He was also called Our Lord the Pope. He wore the three tiaras that symbolizes dominion over heaven, hell, and uh, the earth. He sits between the cherubim, proclaiming to forgive sins. He proclaims to be infallible. He gives indulgences. Yeah, that's, that's a counterfeit God king on earth that stands in the place of Christ. So that person, that man, that God King, is the maximum rebellion. Six, imperfection, sin, maximized times three. That character is what you take upon yourself when you obey his commands. When you obey Christ's command to rest on the seventh day and to enter his rest and to remember that he died for you and he rested on the seventh day and he also created creation and he rested with Adam and Eve, therefore those who rest and trust in Christ and the gospel will inherit the king 
uh, the kingdom and rest with him forever. The Sabbath is a picture of eternity and of salvation and also an extension of God's character. So if you choose to obey the devil's Sabbath and you're saying, I'm going to trust in the devil, you may not be aware that you're saying that, but that's what you're saying. And soon there will be laws and legislations designed to make you make a choice. And if you make the choice, you make the wrong choice, what you're basically saying to God is, I trust the devil to give me rest. I trust the devil to be my provider, and I trust the devil that he's the creator of this beautiful golden age that we've entered. That's exactly what you're saying. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what the people who are going to take the mark, i.e. the character, the word mark in, in uh, Revelation is sharagma, which is where we get our word character from. So it's not a physical mark. You're taking upon yourself the rebellious character of the man of sin by obeying him. When Adam and Eve obeyed the devil, they took on the character of the devil. They rebelled against God without even realizing it because they thought they were doing something good. Of course, initially, maybe they thought that, but immediately they realized they did something really bad because their conscience kicked in. So the point is, either way, that the number 666 is not something that John intended to be gematria or numerological, numerologically you know, divined or anything like that. It is a symbol. It is a symbol to represent to you in a numeric way what this means spiritually. And of course, that means maximum rebellion to God by taking on the character of the man of sin. So, very, very important. We know that the occult love to use the numbers and everything they do, so we shouldn't align with that. And we know that there is evidence of Francis Bacon tampering with the King James and inserting his beliefs and ciphers and things like that into, uh, into the Bible, into the text of the Bible to basically wink towards his friends and whoever, who, who knows whatever else. It doesn't matter because God used it for the good, but the point is to not idolize these things because they do not come from God. God did not ordain, or I should say that God did not, because he ordains all things, but God does not intend for you to go and search for secret knowledge and secret meaning in his word with numbers, okay? Or to rely on numerological proofs, which all people do, by the way, even the pagans, as a way to say, look, the Bible's true. So this is, again, something we need to avoid. So let's look at a couple of important resources. This is from karm.org. Dictionary, Gematria. Let's see what Gematria is. Gematria is the study of the numeric equivalents of Hebrew and Greek letters in order to find hidden meanings in the words. Really quick pause. Hebrew here is Masoretic Hebrew. It's not the original Paleo-Hebrew that actually was the original scriptures written in. Very important that you remember that. In both Hebrew and Greek, the language in which the Bible was written, no, that's why I gave you that qualifier, the language of the Bible, the Old Testament, was Paleo-Hebrew. Eventually, the scriptures were migrated into Aramaic and square script and r rabbinic Hebrew, Mishnaic Hebrew, which is a magical alphabet. So remember that. There are only alpha characters. There are no numeric characters. Therefore, when a Hebrew would want to write a number, he would use the corresponding Hebrew letter. Various numbers are supposed to have spiritual meanings. Here are a few examples. Four is the number of creation. The earth mentioned on the fourth clause of the Lord's Prayer, northeast, southwest, four corners of the earth. Five is the number of grace. Six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. The sixth commandment says, thou shalt not murder. Seven is the number of spiritual perfection. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Eight people on Noah's Ark. A baby is circumcised on the eighth day. Jesus rose on the first day of the week, which is the eighth day. Nine is the number of judgment. 39 is the number of mercy, 40 of testing and judgment, 666 is the number of the Antichrist, the numeric value of his name in Greek equivalent, Jumatra. This is not true. John is not giving you a code that you need to try to figure out through Jumatria who the name of this person is. This is nonsense. But anyway, the point is to see what these things, how these things are perceived by most people. There are some amazing numeric patterns found in the Bible. Let's see. There are 21 Old Testament writers whose names appear in the Bible, 3 times 7. The numeric value of their names is divisible by 7. Of these, 21, 7 are named in the New Testament, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Hosea, and Joel. The numeric values of these names are 1554, which is 222 times 7. David's name is found 11, 1134 times, which is 162 times 7. 
gives you a little link to go and see more of these things. So, very interesting patterns. The gematria of the name Jesus in Greek results in 888. In John 21, 11, after the resurrection, the disciples caught 153 fish. The word fish in Greek is ixtus, which is uh, has a numerical equivalent of 1,224, or 8 times 153. Also, 153 people received a blessing from Jesus in the four Gospels, not counting the 5,000 and examples like that. The Greek word for law is nomos, which has a gematria of 430. Paul says that the law came 430 years after Abraham went to Egypt in Galatians 3. The Jews were in Egypt for 430 years. Not true. Maybe you remember that from the Masoretic thing. And after being freed, they received the law of Moses. You see, this is an example. I was told you that people use these things for, for the wrong purposes. They were not in Egypt for 430 years, so therefore your gematria calculation here doesn't work. So all these things need to be taken with a grain of salt because it depends on the translation. But uh, let's see, was there anything else? Yeah, there are many gematria. So here's like a little chart, and it tells you, you know, here's the numerical value of this letter. And again, this is Mishnaic Hebrew. This is not original Hebrew. This is taken from the Aramaic alphabet, and they added numbers and meanings, and they added little crowns and squiggles and things to make it an esoteric alphabet. Please watch my Masoretic documentary so you understand that modern quote-unquote Hebrew is not real Hebrew. Of course, this happens in Greek, too, because as you'll learn, Greek is uh, very influenced by the mystery religion through people like Pythagoras, who is very much into the occult and who influenced many, many things and other philosophers after him. But moving on, one more paragraph. There are many geometry relationships found in the, both the Old and New Testament writings. As you can see from the citations given above, mystical interpretations could be discovered as well as inferred by examining the mathematical equivalents of various numeric words, and then attempting to discover what those mathematical relationships might mean. Though it does seem that there are some very legitimate and interesting geometry relationships found in the Bible, we can also see that Kabbalists could take the phenomenon too far in their esoteric and mystical explanations of scripture. Indeed, and this is exactly what the KGV Olyists do, they do nothing different than the Kabbalists. So when your practice does not distinguish you from the pagans, and the Bible tells you that you need to be holy, i.e. set apart, that's a red flag that your movement is a psyop. But I want to point back to these examples that were given where, you know, like the 21 Old Testament writers whose names appear in the Bible, three times seven, all these proofs that were given, they were not in uh, the KJV. These are just generic. I don't know what translation they were using to come up with these particular calculations, but they seem to be applicable to all, most translations, because they're very generic. So there you go. There's proofs in other translations too, which is very important. But again, the original scriptures, the Old Testament, were not written in modern Masoretic Hebrew. They were written in a particular alphabet that was a pictographical type of alphabet where the pictures, the letters were pictures, but they were pictures of the sound of the word. And we talk about that in the Masoretic episode. But today's Hebrew is a magical alphabet. It's designed to make sigils and sigil magic and runes and do occult things. Again, in my Sacred Name series, I talk about the controversy that people think that Yahweh is an occult name. And the reason they think that is because the devil has deceived many people with this Masoretic thing. And you see the occult, you see Aleister Crowley, you see people who are neck deep in the devil's soup using the Masoretic writing of Yahweh for all sorts of occult nonsense, which of course is just counterfeit. And that's why people think, well, Yahweh must be an occult name. Well, no, it's, it's not an occult name. God has, has allowed these people to do what they're doing. That doesn't mean that the truth is corrupted. The truth is the truth. And we look at that in the Sacred Name series. Greek has gematria as well. But again, these things are pagan. So the idea of attaching numbers to letters and finding numerical patterns as a result is divination. And adding up numbers, uh, adding up the words and letters and seeing how many numbers and, and crisscrossing them and things like that. All of this is divination, folks. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything about the Bible. It really doesn't, because you can see other translations have these patterns too. So, this is how the devil baits you, folks. He, he baits you into fleshly thinking, into the physical world, into superstition, into legalism. You know, could these be a general sign that an infinite intelligence is at play? Yeah, maybe. We'll, we'll talk about that. 
maybe there's some harmonious property to language because God is perfect and everything he makes is harmonious. So it's not just the King James Bible that has these patterns. Language in general seems to have these patterns, and you'll see more and more examples of that. Nature is harmonious. Remember, one of the qualities of the created world is harmony and balance, which is because God is perfectly wise and just. So these things might just be an extension of God's natural way of doing things, which is very harmonious and balanced and perfect. But again, we want to be very conservative and cautious with that assessment. It seems from where everything I've looked at that language has a natural harmonious property to it, which is very interesting in and of itself. That's an interesting phenomenon. But what you what conclusions you draw from that is very important. If the conclusion you're drawing from all these things today that we're going to be covering is, gosh, God is just so amazing and perfect and wise. It's really, truly amazing how he's made everything so harmonious. Even language, all kinds of languages have th these patterns in them. That is a good way to think about it, to glorify God. If the conclusion you're drawing is, wow, the KJV is this anointed vessel and it's the only perfect translation, therefore I have to cling to it, then you are being baited into fundamentalism for the wrong things. So don't be baited. Some other things to consider on this are the following four points. The Bible, i.e. the meaning, the message, comes from God who is perfect and omnipotent, and very likely it will have informational perfection to some degree and symmetry because it comes from God. Again, God can't do anything imperfectly, so it does stand to reason that the thing that he revealed, which is the message, is harmonious, right? It's not just true, right? Because you could have something that's true, but it's you know, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe truth inherently is harmonious. Very interesting thought right there. But either way, it's not just true, it's also harmonious, like you saw in some of those generic things, like uh, 21 Old Testament writers, and if you divide, it's, it's three times seven, and the sevens are everywhere, right? So that's interesting. I, I think there's definitely a possibility for that, but that's not unique to the KJV. Second point, nobody's studied other translations, other languages, you know, other versions of the Bible to see what correlations exist in these translations. I gave you some examples in this recent article that all translations seem to have some patterns in them, but has anybody belabored to go, okay, let's go in-depth through the ESV, through Young's literal translation, through the KJV, through the new, uh, new international version, the new living translation. Let's go through all of these and see what numerical patterns we can find. Has anybody actually done that? The answer is no, at least not that I've found. If you do, please, you know, uh, share it. But either way, the point is nobody's done this. That would be the scientific thing to do. If you're really trying to prove, and you'll see again that there's nothing scientific about this at all. There's a lot of numbers and number patterns, and it seems, oh my gosh, it must be true. Well, if you're really trying to prove a phenomenon, you need a bigger sample size. You really do. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But it's not that simple. Again, there, there are variants in every manuscript. So the question is, which changes do you accept? Which ones do you go with and which ones do you not go with? Right? Because even with the Textus Receptus, if you recall, there are 27 books that were made that can be called Textus Receptus. And if you did the numerology patterns on each one of those, each one of those is rendered slightly differently because they used different manuscripts. And those manuscripts had different variations from each other. So if you did the numerology on each of them, I'm willing to bet that it's going to be slightly different for each. You see the problem? Like something that's going to work in one version is not going to work in another because the words are totally different. They're not like totally different in the sense where the meaning is off, but they're very differently. Just like with, what's his name, Francis Bacon, how he, remember with Psalm 46, we compared those two translations, how he changed the wording slightly so that the shake and spear would be exactly 46 letters instead of 47 or 46 words from the beginning and from the end, rather than being 47 and 44. The meaning doesn't change. The meaning is equivalent. I mean, relatively, you can hardly tell that it's a translation change, but it's different which changes the numerology. So this is this is the thing that nobody keeps in mind with all this uh, KJV-only stuff, with the numerology proofs. This is the problem. And nobody seems to have a, a critical way of examining this because they want to hang on to a particular tradition. It's too emotionally comforting to think, oh gosh, 
here's my KJV with all these numerological proofs, and the, the idea that other translations could have the same thing, and it's completely dependent upon the wording and all this stuff, then it's just that people don't want to entertain that because of cognitive dissonance. In science, you need a massive sample, sample pool for your data if you want to establish something that is consistent, a pattern that's relevant, that's statistically significant. You need sample size. When you have a study and you're doing a study on a particular supplement or whatever else, and you read that study and say, oh, okay, the study was done on 12 participants. Okay, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. If a study's done on 10,000 participants, and you follow those participants over, you know, 20 years, okay, that has way more weight than a study that was done on 12 participants over six weeks. Totally different thing. So this is, the, this is the way you need to think about these things, that your sample size needs to be way more significant. Again, to this date, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, nobody has done these calculations for every translation, number one, and every language that these translations have been translated in. I am willing to bet not a stretch, not a stretch whatsoever. I'm willing to bet that in both of those categories, you will find significant numerical patterns. Which, what does that say about the KJV? Well, it says that this whole KJV only movement is nonsense. Nobody has run it on every single manuscript in the original languages, right? So that's another thing. Translations in English, translations in other language languages, and checking the original manuscripts. And seeing, of course, we don't have completely intact manuscripts, but this is, again, what do you do? If you, Let's say you create a majority text from certain manuscripts, and you compare that to, let's say, another majority text grouping where you have a different um, qualification that you're bringing all these manuscripts together, you're going to find different numerological patterns because the wording is different. And, of course, we don't know which ones are the original, so how do you decide what's what? This is, this is the thing. Nobody's done this. It's just only being done on the KJV, and people are buying it because they don't think critically. It's not statistically significant for one translation out of the hundreds that have been created in the last however many hundred years. For this, and if you include, if you include all the revisions, there are thousands of translations that have been made. Nobody has bothered to do all this work because it's a lot of work and nobody wants to do that. People like to go for the low hanging fruit. Remember the problem of majority text, which is majority of what? and what time. At certain time frames, certain manuscripts are more majority than others. And even if you just do majority text within, let's say, the Greek manuscripts, well, most of the manuscripts are in other languages, actually. So it's all relative. Math is relative. People, I've talked about this in my heliocentric conspiracy. People have this idea that when they see math and numbers and formulas, that, oh, it must be true. I got to pay attention. You know, it must be some truth here. No. Math is harmonious, but math can be used to, to deceive you just like pretty language. Math just shows relationships between things. It doesn't mean that it's true. And we talk about that quite a bit as it relates to cosmology, but math is math. And certainly math can express truth just like language, but it can also deceive you just like language. Number three on this list, so what are the first two points here? The Bible comes from God, who is perfect, so is it likely that there's some sense of informational perfection in, in the message, not any translations? The message, yes. Therefore, the translations will reflect some of that numerological perfection, and probably because everything in nature in, cr in the created world is harmonious, and there's laws about things, very likely language itself has some, you know, sort of harmonious component, because you'll see these things everywhere. That's number one. Point number two is that nobody's bothered to be scientific about this and study multiple translations, multiple other languages, you know, things like that, to basically do a collated sample pool and, and see what the relationships are. Nobody's ever done that. The day that we'll do that, you will have mathematical proof that the KJV only movement is nonsense. But today we'll give you plenty of proof as well. The third point on this is that the meaning of these numbers is subjective. The article that I just read to you gives you some meanings, but these aren't objective. God never said, from now on, the number four is going to mean this. The number seven is going to mean this. No, there are things that numbers are associated to. Seven is associated to the Sabbath, to completion. It seems that God prefers sevens when he's talking about things that are cyclical and completions. You know, like uh, the Jubilee, seven times seven is 49, then you have a 50th year. So there are certain things that seem 
to be regular numbers that God uses, for sure. But God never expressly says, this is what this number means. Because if he did, you would be drifting, the devil would take it immediately, and look at what the devil is doing with numerology these days, where God hasn't expressly said what these numbers mean. Imagine if God did say, okay, from now on, four is going to equal this, what this meaning. People would be so obsessed with numerology and divination, the devil would be having a heyday. That's exactly why God doesn't reveal what these numbers mean. Maybe they do have a meaning, maybe they don't. But either way, God does certainly prefer certain numbers for certain things. He has a very specific way of doing things. So, there are numbers that are used in the Bible, but they're not objective. One, obviously one God, two, two witnesses needed for the truth, Man, male and female, three, three days, three nights, There's certain themes and scriptures with the resurrection, the Trinity, six is the day of man, seven, the Sabbath, 12 tribes of Israel, 50 with the Jubilee years, 70 years in the Babylon, uh, Babylonian captivity, 430 years of sojourning, 666, the mark of the beast, 1260, which is the uh, year uh, amount of years that the Antichrist power rules before it receives a mortal wound. There's many numbers in the Bible, but their meaning is based on the context. 1260 is specifically related to you in terms of the Antichrist power and nothing else. People take that and apply it to other things and say, oh, see, we can import that meaning into this context. They're doing the same thing they do with Strong's Concordance, which is an illegitimate totality transfer. Meaning you take a number like seven, okay, seven, and, and it has, it could mean a multitude of things, right? Just like we do with concordances. Seven could mean the Sabbath, it could mean rest, it could mean completion, you know, it could mean all sorts of things. So you take that and you say, okay, um, it seems that God appears seven times in this particular text. Well, this text must really be talking about rest. I, I really feel like God is speaking to me about rest and this and you know, completion in my life right now. Do you see how easy it is to just, you know, take things and, and mishmash some meanings together and, and create a, a false prophecy? People do this all the time, through numerology, through man-centered gospels, through all sorts of modern-day, you know, deceptions. So, assigning meaning to numbers is numerology, it's divination. God did not give you a list of, of numbers and said, okay, this is what numbers mean, and also, he didn't say, every letter has this number, so this is how you need to do these things. Absolutely not. This is from the devil. The meanings of various numbers are completely dependent on their context that they're used, so do not commit an illegitimate totality transfer. And they're relative. They really are relative. They really depend on what they're being assigned to in a particular day. Eight is when it's assigned to the day of circumcision, Eight means, okay, on the eighth day, the baby will get circumcised. That's what it means. It doesn't mean anything else. Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week or on the eighth day. Well, which one? Day one or day eight? Which one are we counting? You see, everything is relative, and you can make something mean out of... You can make meaning out of anything, is the point. There's no objective list of this is what this means. This is the point. All of this is subjective. So if you're dealing with something subjective, automatically you're not dealing with anything scientific, but rather completely subjective. Now, of course, number four is just statistics and the statistical nature of things. Let's see here. Uh, there's a video from this guy on YouTube, which kind of brings the point home. Let's listen. Look, I'll make up my own right now. Let's pick a number. What's a biblical number? Let's do 666, the mark of the beast. Let's just go to the 666th verse of the Bible, which happens to be Genesis 31 verse 1. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all the wealth from what belonged to our father. Oh my gosh. Verse 666 is about Jacob. What does Jacob's name get changed to? Israel. The Antichrist is Israel. It's not a person, it's a whole group. Or maybe the Antichrist is coming from Israel. We've cracked the code. It makes sense it would come from God's own chosen people. And how much further down the verses do we find out that Jacob becomes Israel? 27 verses later. That's how many chapters are in the New Testament. Look, it's all making sense. No, it's not. None of that makes sense. But I guarantee you, I could get this thing shipped around the internet. You can do this with anything. You can do this with anything. 
And that's exactly the point, folks. I mean, this is just one example of a million. And there are so many poor correlations that people make with numbers instead of what? Instead of studying the Bible with all of the Fennec Fox skills that I described to you in this particular video, in the Berean video, in the Masoretic PSYOP, the devil doesn't want you to be a Berean. The devil doesn't want you to be sober-minded and to use the sort of truth with skill. The devil wants you to be clumsy, to be easily baited, to be able to go off balance quickly, to not be coordinated spiritually, to not be in alignment spiritually, so that he can push you to the left or to the right. And these, this is the way that he does it. This is a subtle attack on the Word of God by making you basically prefer superficial and superstitious things as proof so that you can be discredited easily because everybody does this. And so somebody who's a non-believer can say, well, these are not statistically meaningful at all. And now you've closed off the wall between you and them to evangelize them because they're going to look at you as a Looney Tunes. And it attacks you and your knowledge because you're basically learning to train your mind in a, in a very fleshly way that, oh, I'm going to look for numerological patterns rather than actually reading in context, understanding apologetics, understanding why the Bible is true, why all versions can be trusted, why the message has been preserved, understanding your history. All of these things are so much more important than knowing your numerological proofs and, and seeing numerological proofs in a particular text. It's really, it really is. I hope that some people wake up through this. Okay, let's talk about the Bible code. The Bible code, also known as the Torah code, is a purported set of encoded words within a Hebrew text of the Torah that, according to proponents, has predicted significant historical events. The statistical likelihood of the Bible code arising by chance has been thoroughly researched, and it is now widely considered to be statistically insignificant. As similar phenomenon can be observed in any sufficiently lengthy text. Although Bible codes have been postulated and studied for centuries, the subject has been popularized in modern times by Michael Drosnan's The Bible Code and The Omega Code, both of which were used by the dispensationalists quite a bit. Some tests purportedly showing statistically significant codes in the Bible were published as a challenging puzzle in peer-reviewed academic journal 1994, which was pronounced solved in subsequent 1999 paper published in the same journal. So this whole Bible Code thing, as you can see, this is what it is. We can pull up the picture. The idea of the Bible code is you take lettering, or I should say wording of a particular section, and you take out the spaces, you just put the, the words one after the other, and you create a rule, like, okay, I'm going to skip over two and go up one. And you see if there's a pattern if you do that. Well, in this case, you see Bible and then code in, in two different rules of skipping. But the question is, is this... Does this prove that there's some intelligence, or I should say that that, that there's an, in, an intent, because there is an intelligence behind the, the Bible and the message, but does this prove that there is an intent behind this, that, that God wants us to be hunting for these secret words in, uh, in the message, or is there something more to the story, that this is just a phenomenal, phenomenological thing that happens in language? Very important. So that's what the Bible code is. I don't think I highlighted anything else on here. I did. I did highlight. Criticism of the original paper. In 1999, Australian mathematician Brendan McKay, Israeli mathematician's drawer bar Natan Gil Kalai, and Israeli psychologist Maya Bar Hillel, collectively known as MBBK, published a paper in Statistical Science in which they argued that the cause, the case of Whitsum, Rips, and Rosenberg, WRR, was fatally defective and that the result merely reflects on the choices made in designing their experiment and collecting the data for it, i.e. bias. The way that they designed this experiment basically set them up to get the results that they got. The MBBK paper was reviewed anonymously by four professional statisticians prior to publication. In the introduction to the paper, Robert Koss, the editor of the journal who previously had described the WRR paper as a challenging puzzle, wrote that considering the work of McKay, you know, MBBK as a whole, it indeed appears as they conclude that the puzzle has been solved, i.e. it's been refuted. From their observations, MBBK created an alternative hypothesis to explain the puzzle of how the codes were discovered. MBBK's argument was not strictly mathematical, rather it asserted that WRR's authors, contributors, had intentionally selected the names and or dates in advance and designed their experiments to match their selection, thereby achieving their desired result. The MBBK paper argued that the ELS experiment, which is um, the, the way, the, the rules of how to find the particular distances and intervals between the letters, like we saw in that previous graphic, 
is extraordinarily sensitive to very small changes in the spellings of appellations, and the WRR result merely reflects on the choices made in designing their experiment and collecting data for it. The MBBK paper demonstrated that this tuning, when combined with what MBBK asserted was available wiggle room, was capable of generating a result similar to WRR's Genesis result in a Hebrew translation of War and Peace. Bar Hillel subsequently summarized the MBBK view that the WRR paper was a hoax and an intentionally carefully designed magic trick. And of course, there's a lot of controversy around this, and they've responded and uh, you know, gone back and forth. This is criticism of Michael Drosnan, who is the author of the Bible Code. Journalist Drosnan's, journalist Drosnan's books have been criticized by some who believe that the Bible Code is real, but that it cannot predict the future. You don't need Bible codes to predict the future, folks. The Bible's already predicted the future. On Drosnan's claim of Yitzhak Rabin's assassination, Drosnan wrote in his book, The Bible Code, that Yigar Amir could not be found in advance. Critics have noted a huge error in the code Drosnan claimed to have found. Drosnan misused the Bible verse, Deuteronomy 4, verse 42. Scholars note, quote, For example, citing again the passage intersecting with Rabin, that passage is from Deuteronomy 4, verse 42, but Drosnan ignores the words immediately following a murderer who will murder. What comes next is the phrase unwittingly. This is because the verse deals with the cities of refuge where accidental killers can, be, can find asylum. In this case, then, the message would refer to an accidental killing or of, of Rabin, and it would therefore be wrong. So he ignored, you know, evidence against him. Another message, page 17, supposedly contains a complete description of the terrorist bombing of a bus in Jerusalem on February 25th, 1996. It includes the phrase fire, great noise, but overlooks the fact that the letters which make up those words were actually part of the larger phrase from Genesis 35 verse 4, which says, under the terebinth that was near Shechem. If that, if the phrase does tell of a bus bombing, why not take it to indicate that it would be in Nablus, the site of ancient Shechem? So really quick pause. Do you see the harlotry that is the same with the Talmudic Jews? They're applying all of these Torah codes to their own. Oh, this is what's going to happen in Jerusalem with this and that. And of course, these things are fakery. They're not actually, this is false prophets. Wolves in sheep's clothing that, that Jesus warned about. Not just in the church, but really everywhere. There's false prophets everywhere to, teaching you all these different lies and trying to have authority in your mind. But th the same way the KJV only is used, the KJV and, say, and they point to themselves and to their movement as the truth, the, t the Talmudic rabbinic Jews were using, you know, and they still use the, these Torah codes and Bible codes for gematria and say, oh, look, Israel's going to do this and Israel's going to do that. And the rabbis are always making prophecies with, with gematrical values. So just keep that in mind. Moving on. Drosnan also made a number of claims and alleged predictions that have since failed. Among the most important, Drosnan clearly states in his book, The Bible Code 2, published in December 2nd, 2002, that there was to be a world war involving an atomic holocaust that would allegedly be the end of the world. Has that happened? Another claim Drosnan makes in the Bible Code 2 is that the nation of Libya would develop weapons of mass destruction which could then be given to terrorists who would then use them to attack the West, specifically the United States. In reality, Libya improved relations with the West in 2003 and gave up all their existing weapons of mass destruction programs. A final claim Drosnan made in the Bible Code 2 is that the Palestinian Authority leader Yasser Arafat would allegedly be assassinated by being shot to death by gunmen, which Drosnan specifically stated would be from the Palestinian Hamas movement. The prediction, this prediction by Drosnan also failed, as Yasser Arafat died on November 11, 2004, of what was later declared to be natural causes, specifically a stroke brought on by unknown infection. So what does the book of Deuteronomy tell you about a prophet? If he says that something's going to happen and in, in appealing to God, i.e. you're appealing to the Bible, that the Bible tells you this, which is really you're saying that God is saying this, you're a false prophet. You're, you're making a claim that God is saying something's going to happen, and it doesn't happen, therefore you are the false prophet, because God, if God does actually say it's going to happen, then it will happen. Oh, goodness, so much of this to look at. The statistics of the improbable. This is from Web Archive. I think this is a Wayback Machine, but uh, where is it from? It's from towardsdatascience.com. I had to go back to the Wayback Machine because I think this is one of those paywalled things. But let's read a little bit about it. The 1994 researchers from Hebrew University at Jerusalem published a paper in the journal Statistics, Statistical Science claiming to find evidence that the book of Genesis predicts the future. The result baffled the researchers as well as the editor, who prefaced the article with the remark that the paper is offered to statistical science re readers as a challenging puzzle. What did the researchers claim to have found, and how? 
the Bible code puzzle. The authors are looking for so-called equidistant letters. The sequence of letters, if you look at every fifth letter in the book of Genesis, for instance. They were testing if the letter sequences thus generated would contain the names, birth dates, and date death dates of a list of 32 notable rabbis, covering the entire span of Jewish history. If they were able to find such a pattern, this would prove in their view that the book of Genesis, in fact, had predictive power. This is the same exact argument that the KJV only use to justify their movement. The KJV has XYZ numerical patterns, therefore, that's how they get you. You always got to find the therefore. You got to sniff it out. Be a good fox. Therefore, the KJV is an anointed translation by God and all other translations are corrupt. So keep that in mind. Uh, in fact, the researchers found the rabbi pattern hidden in equidistant letter sequences which surprised themselves as well as their readers. One reader journalist, Michael Drosnan, made it his mission to find even more patterns which formed the bulk of his 1997 book, The Bible Code. What's going on here? Does the Bible really have predictive power? Of course it does. Now, this particular view is secular, so just keep that in mind. They say, of course not. What happened here is an instance of a so-called look elsewhere effect. So, of course, they don't really believe in the Bible's predictive power, but that doesn't mean that what they say about the statistical issues should be disregarded. This is the look elsewhere effect, which is very important to understand. The book of Genesis is a massive document. By allowing themselves to vary the start of the equidistant letter sequences, their spacings, as well as the particular version of the rabbi's name to look for, the authors are giving themselves a huge amount of wiggle room. Do you get it? They could vary... Well, there's different spellings of the rabbi's name that we could also try different sequences. Eventually, you'll find something in such a huge document. And it is this wiggle room that produced the spurious statistical signal. Given such a large number of different combinations of search parameters, it is not unlikely at all to, de to detect the list of rabbis or any other list of names you might be searching for. The original paper was officially rebutted in 1997 when Brendan McKay and collaborators published Solving the Bible Code puzzle in the same journal, which we looked at. The more opportunities you give yourself to be surprised, the more likely you'll be surprised. This is the nature of the look elsewhere effect. Consider a Swedish study from 1992 linking living near power lines to childhood leukemia. The researchers surveyed everyone living within 300 meters of a high voltage power line over a 25 year period and looked for statistically significant increases in rates of over 800 different ailments. Of course, by looking at so many different possibilities at once, it is pretty much guaranteed to find at least one statistically significant signal simply by chance. Yeah, because the variance is just so high. You have 800 different ailments. You're going to find a pattern somewhere and correlate it to something that is not necessarily correlated. Or consider the North Carolina lottery coincidence. The winning numbers picked in the North Carolina Cash 5 lottery game, 4, 21, 23, 34, 39, were identical on July 9th and 11th, 2007. Of course, this is highly unlikely with odds of only two in a million, and some observers even suspected fraud. However, before rushing to any judgments, think again about the look elsewhere effect here. This particular lottery had been operating for almost a year at a time. And in addition, there had been hundreds of other five number lotteries operating for many years all over the country. With so many lotteries in so many different places in operation for such a long time, it is not unlikely at all to find two identical draws in three days in one of them. Yeah, to us, it seems like some sort of magical thing happened. But really, if you have perspective, right, you have a top-down perspective, you see that this is, there's so many of these things going on at some time, it just happens that you happen to be in the one where the coincidence happened. Uh, let's see here, the problem with frequent statistics, where we want, uh, there was one here that I highlighted, I think it was this, frequent statistics. The look, the look elsewhere effect fundamentally highlights a problem with what is known as frequentist statistics. Frequentist statistics, we perform hypothesis testing as follows. Assuming the null hypothesis, i.e. the... Now, again, this person doesn't believe the Bible has predictive power. Assuming the null hypothesis, e.g. the Bible does not predict the future, how does it... How possible is it to find the measured observation, e.g. the names of, and deaths of the rabbis? If that probability is less than certain threshold, for example, 0.05, then researchers see the result as statistically significant as evidence in favor of rejecting the null hypothesis, i.e. that the Bible can predict the future, which of course it can, but in their example, predicting, you know, things in Jerusalem through number codes. Even though this approach is widely used today, there are a number of problems with it, one of them being its inherent proneness to the look elsewhere effect. 
When performing just 20 different tests, it is likely to find one statistically significant signal simply by chance alone. This can happen if one research team looks for a signal in 20 different ways, as in the XKCD comic below, which I don't think will pull up because for some reason this is not showing the pictures, or if 20 different research teams around the globe look for a particular signal, in which case only one team that found a spurious signal will publish their results. Okay, think Bayes, the alternative frequentist to frequentist statistics. If frequentist statistics in some ways flawed and given flawed results, is there an alternative? Yes. The answer is Bayesian statistics. The most important difference between these two flavors of statistics is that the Bayesian framework forces you to formulate your prior beliefs. For instance, my prior, uh, my prior on the Bible's ability to predict the future is essentially zero. So even the result from the Hebrew research team will not move this prior belief a lot. Only if I were to see more and more of the same evidence in other places would I start to change my views. Maybe if you would read the Bible and realize how history does confirm the Bible, you might actually change your views. The same with power lines. My prior belief for power lines causing leukemia is close to zero as well, given, that we, given what we know about medicine, human anatomy, and electromagnetism. Thus, even the results published by the Swedish research team would not change my beliefs unless they are backed up elsewhere. Bayesian thinking can thus protect us from the look-elsewhere effect. Thinking about our priors first can, pre can prevent accept accepting st statistically significant results that are really the results of chance. Conclusion. Blame the game, not the player. In order to understand the severeness of the problem caused by the look-elsewhere effects, consider the roles of the researchers around the world, working hard on their research projects and trying to survive in a competitive environment. This, this part's important. In order to establish themselves in the academic world and, and secure funding, researchers want to publish novel and interesting results and not merely try to reproduce prior results from other teams. Unfortunately, this makes it unlikely that fluke results will be debunked by follow-up studies. Physician and scientist John Yodanis makes an even stronger claim in a 2005 paper, arguing that most published research findings are false. This is in 2005. The problem is thus not with the individual researchers, but with the, with the entire academic publisher parish culture. Yeah, they have a huge pressure to be unique and because everybody is competing for grant money. So again, just Genesis curse, human flesh, corruption. Science is not immune from these things, folks. This is an example of a system where the game is to blame, not the player, a phenomenon I wrote about in more detail in a previous post here. There are many more examples of look, look elsewhere effects and flawed statistics than I can mention here, and if you pay attention to the world around you, you will see them. The next time you hear someone claiming that toads predict earthquakes, that some gene predicts IQ level, or that certain foods are bad for you, think about the look elsewhere effect. How many other animals, genes, or food items did they test as well? And most importantly, Know what your prior beliefs are. This is important statistical information. You should know that the KJV numerological things, although they seem impressive, when you take other texts into consideration, which we will, you will see that they're nothing special. Therefore, your conclusion must change. It's not that God ordained the KJV as a special translation, but maybe, maybe there's just probability involved, or the fact that language has a quality to it that's very harmonious because, again, it's part of nature. It's part of what God created, like the rules of physics and chemistry. Everything is very harmonious and balanced. So what you're dealing with is more of a generalized phenomenological situation, not something specific to the KJV. Numerology. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Numerology, how to tell the science from pseudoscience, from IFL science. We all agree math is pretty amazing, but did you know it can literally tell the future? At least that's what proponents of numerology believe, that the numerical, numerical values of your birth and name can reveal deep truths about your personality and destiny. And like it, and like, it's got numbers in it, right? So it's kind of looks, it kind of looks sciency. And according to this one article you googled, it was invented by Pythagoras and he was, and he has his own theorem named after it. So this can't just be another piece of occult nonsense like astrology. This must be legit science, right? Where did numerology come from? Despite claims that Pythagoras invented numerology, there's plenty of evidence of people linking math and mysticism before him. Of course, that was old as time, folks. This is the mystery religion. What is true, though, is that the most common rules of numerology in use today can be traced back to Pythagoras and his followers, including the meanings behind each number and apparently also the numerical values assigned to each uh, letter of the alphabet. Now, notwithstanding that Pythagoras didn't use the modern English alphabet, so probably didn't actually come up with these with those values, 
We should definitely make something clear here. Pythagoras was a weird guy. Yes, he was. And in my heliocentric conspiracy, we talk quite a bit about him. Just because he invented something doesn't mean it's correct. The guy literally died because he was scared of beans after all. Yeah, he was afraid of something I forget, and he basically just fasted to death. So when Pythagoras or his followers decided that five represents justice, for example, that wasn't based on scientific endeavors. It was basically just based on ancient Greek vibes. Why else would he decide that all even numbers are female and all odd numbers are male, for example? Objectively, it makes no sense. And while some practitioners may point to numerology's 2,500-year-old origin story as proof of its longevity, the truth is that the idea pretty much died out until the end of the 19th century. In its modern form, it purports to divine occult wisdom about people based on simple math, a practice that most say works due to the inherent vibrations of numbers. In other words, it's still all based on vibes. What is the difference between science and pseudoscience? The question of what makes good science is not quite as cut and dried as you might expect, but there are a few pretty good guidelines that can help us figure out whether an idea should be taken seriously or not. Perhaps the most obvious test is whether an idea or model adheres to the scientific method. Already, we're going to run into some problems here because the scientific method is kind of a misnomer, but basically what we're looking for is a hypothesis that can be tested as, an, as objectively as possible, which can then be used to make accurate predictions about the world. Has the KJV numerological proofs, have they been tested as objectively as possible? Definitely not. Does numerology adhere to this standard? The hypothesis of numerology presumably is that adding up the numbers associated with your birthday, of course, this is about birthdays, but it still applies to our discussion. And name reveals something deep about your personality, destiny, and so on. But can this hypothesis be tested objectively? It's not too hard to think of a potential experiment. Just work out the birth numbers and, and name numbers of, sample, of a sample of people and see how accurate the resulting predictions are. But there are a couple of problems here already because the result you get will depend on your culture and chosen numerology chart. The biggest criticism of numerology is that it's based on the invented system of counting, an N invented system of counting. This system was developed to allow people to count objects in groups of 10 rather than a single number. Notes Tracy Wilson for How Stuff Works. However, this system is known as a base 10 system. It's not the only system of counting. Indigenous tribes in Australia, New Guinea, Africa, and South America developed number systems that counted in pairs. Some societies also used base 12 and base 60, which we still use to tell time. This problem doesn't occur with real math. The circumference of a circle divided by its diameter will always be pi, for example, regardless of what base you're using. Working out your birth number, however, only works in base 10, and only using the Western Gregorian calendar. Similarly, many have a selection of names they go by in various contexts. You may have a nickname that you use more often than your legal, nick your legal name, or a middle name that you have kept secret for 30 years out of embarrassment. Perhaps you've changed your name entirely at some point, something the vast majority of married women have done, to name just one example. And even at this point, you need to decide what system you're using to translate letters into numbers. The most famous may come from Pythagoras, sure, but it's hardly the only one. There's the Agrippan method, the Chaldean method, the Greek numerals, the Hebrew numerals, and that's just to start. But let's say you get past all those issues and arrive at a framework that all numerologists agree on. How would you test the accuracy of the numerology hypothesis? Well, a few people have tried. Back in 2017, one study calculated the birth numbers of more than 800 Nobel Prize winners, people who have won international recognition for extraordinary contributions. Given the rarity of their accomplishments, numerology should be able to distinguish Nobel laureates from the rest of the population. Operationally, if numerology is true, then the, di the distribution of birth numbers for Nobel Prize winners should significantly diverge from chance. In addition, we would expect different prize categories like chemistry, economics, literature, medicine, peace, and physics to call upon different abilities. Thus, we should expect to find differences in the birth number distribution across prize categories. True. Seems straightforward though, right? So what do the results show? To put it bluntly, the answer is literally nothing. The distribution of birth numbers for all Nobel Prize winners does not deviate significantly from chance, notes the paper. This suggests that the Nobel Prize winners as a group have no special pattern of birth numbers. Additionally, the pattern of birth number distribution between the winners of the six different prizes does not differ from chance expectation. These results provide no support for numerological claims about birth number. Another experiment run by Maurice Townsend for the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomenon, or ASAP, 
back in 1983, looked at more than just birth dates. Townsend received surveys from 96 people collecting data on their name, birth date, address, and place of birth, as well as their self-reported psychic and paranormal interest and ability level. It is generally agreed in numerology that the number seven is associated with people who are psychic or psychically aware, Townsend explained. Thus, it would seem a reasonable prediction that ASAP members who are interested in psychic matters would contain a greater number of sevens in their ranks than the general population. This could test whether the association between the number seven and the paranormal is correct. So, more information, more accuracy, right? Well, again, the results really showed no such hypothesis result, hypothesized, hypothesized result. The most obvious point is that the number seven does not stand out in the results where it would, where it should do, i.e., for psych, um, you know, paranormal-oriented people. Townsend, in, uh, Townsend concluded, and in fact, he noted, if there is a number for being psychic. The graphs would seem to show that five would be a better number than seven. <laughs> in other words, numerology is pretty tough to test scientifically, which is generally a sign that it's not, in fact, science at all. That said, the little experimental data which does exist does not support the hypothesis put forward by numerology, that certain personality types, character strengths, or destinies are intimately associated with certain numbers and found in a person's life. Why does numerology work? Also important. Another widely accepted way to judge between science and pseudoscience is the concept of falsifiability. That is, can the theory or hypothesis be logically contradicted with empirical evidence? The classic example here is the hypothesis, all swans are white. An, an idea that was accepted as entirely true in Europe and Asia for centuries. Then, in 1667, the theory was falsified. The Dutch explorer Wilhelm von Vlaming uh, became the first European to see black swans in Australia proving the hypothesis wrong. Falsifiability plus good old human psychology is a key to understanding what makes numerology work. After all, what kinds of things are being predicted by numerology? Say your birth number turns out to be one. According to believers, this signifies a person who is independent, but can get lonely, sometimes hides insecurities behind bluster, someone who has innate leadership abilities, but suffers without the support of friends and family. Does that sound familiar to you? Wow, maybe your birth number is one. Or more likely, those are just a collection of what are more commonly known as Barnum statements, descriptions which are so vague as to apply in some way to just about anybody. When a statement is so fuzzy like this, it makes it extremely difficult to falsify. Maybe your birth number is one, but you don't consider yourself particularly independent. Well, the numerologist might argue, that's just proof that you crave the support of friends and family. So the prediction is still true. Maybe you don't feel like a natural leader at work or at social in your social life, but a numerology proponent might say, that doesn't mean you're not a natural leader to your children, so that doesn't falsify the hypothesis either. Add to that the natural human tendency towards confirmation bias, and it's easy to see why some people are drawn towards things like numerology. Once one receives a numerology-derived horoscope or fortune or lucky number or lucky color or whatever was produced, one tends to see it everywhere, explains Brian Dunning, in his 2018 episode of Skeptoid Podcast. We all respond to many phrases in most horoscopes because they tend to be things that all want to be true about ourselves. And in most cases, they are true about most people. To anyone who has not studied the ways that these divinations work with human psychology, they do indeed seem compelling. Compelling enough that you don't have to be stupid to be persuaded that there's something there. Basically, the reason numerology works, or astrology, homeopathy, conspiracy theories, or any other pseudoscience, is not because it's backed by science. In fact, any attempt to explore the concept within a scientific framework has shown it to be false. But for some followers of these practices, that probably doesn't matter. After all, it works for them, and where humans are concerned, that's unfortunately often all the evidence we need. This is a perfect statement for the confessional position. The confessional position is not based on anything empirical. It's based completely on an irrational position. Now again, there's parts of it, eat the meat, spit out the bones. It is true that God preserved his word. Absolutely. And hopefully you know that by now. But it is not true that the King James Version is the way that God preserved his word. And of course, it's an emotional position. It's not based on empirical evidence because I've shown you mountains of empirical evidence so far that it cannot be true. And so people reject the empirical evidence and cling to things like numerological proofs. And that's all I need. It's the KJB, KJV, whatever. And that's all that I need to look at. So numerology is pseudoscience. Now let's talk about specific problems with 
Um, actually, this is the next section. So a couple of things to wrap up for the previous things we looked at. I, I talk again about how math can be deceptive. See my heliocentric conspiracy. People are very easily seduced by math. They really are. They're sedu seduced by numbers and patterns and harmonious things because they think that it's authoritative and true. Patterns and numbers and mathematical proofs do not mean that something, it doesn't mean anything. You have to read it in context. And especially with, with these numerological proofs, it's so subjective. What does it mean that the total number of a particular word is 777? What does that mean? What does that mean? How do you infer that, the meaning from that? Well, there is no meaning. Seven could mean a bunch of things. Is it, are you talking that the Bible gives you rest? That, uh, you know, that there, you should worship on the seventh day? Like, what, what conclusion are you taking from that? And if that's the case, if you're taking those conclusions, why don't you just read the Bible? You know, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, math is very powerful a, as a tool, but it's also very powerful for the enemy to deceive you because it's harmonious, and we like shiny things. We like things that are even and and beautiful. So ne math numbers can be used to deceive just like words. That's the, that's the point to take. There's nothing scientific about gematria and numerology and number patterns and finding all these things. There's nothing scientific about them whatsoever. It is completely subjective. Finding meaning, meanings in number patterns is divination. Trying to find secret knowledge in the Bible is Gnosticism. Trying to predict the future with numerology, like the Talmudic Jews do, which of course, King James, King James only us don't do things like the Talmudic Jews, but I want to show you that this isn't limited to the King James Version to find numerological patterns. The spirit that's guiding these types of things is not from God. God is not guiding you to find secret knowledge in number patterns. That spirit manifests in many different ways to deceive people in different particular directions, but it's all really in the same direction, which of course is delusion. There are, because it depends on the particular translation, but the 1611 has 788,000 words, approximately. 788,000 words, that is an enormous amount of content. The odds of seeing patterns and correlations in a document this long, especially if your rules are subjective, are very high. Now, why are these things not scientific? Very important to understand a couple of things. We're going to be looking at some psychology. In college, I studied psychology. It was one of my favorite topics. I have a BS in, or BA in psychology. And it was really, especially behavioral psychology. So fascinating to understand all of these triggers in your mind. And you realize, wow, I really can't choose free of influence. I need the perfect will of God who can choose free of influence to be in my life. Otherwise, I'm predictable. And so this is the point. But psychology is very important to understand in this particular topic with numerology. But why is this not scientific? Well, one of the first reasons why it's not is selection bias. Selection bias means that people are ignoring things that are not meaningful and focusing on the things that are. For example, all those patterns that I read to you in the beginning about the KJV. For each pattern, there has to be a rule. Okay, like, uh, let's say the word capitalized is, what was it, like seven times was listed in the 1611, I believe. Okay, well, that's a rule that you've made. I'm going to look for word capitalized and count how many times it exists. All right, well, did you look for the word Jesus and see how many times it existed? I'm guessing the number probably isn't divisible by seven, or maybe word lowercase, or maybe the word Bible. There are so many rules that there's literally probably almost infinite amount of rules that you can make and combinations of rules and combinations of words that you could make. And most of them are not meaningful. Most of them are. If you understand math and probability, you really see why this is nonsense. For each one of those rules, there are countless more that will produce meaningless results. Again, search for the word Bible, or King, or Bible translation, or whatever. Like, look for various combinations of words, and you will see that there's meaningless numbers that come up. The fact that you found one combination based on one particular rule doesn't mean anything. It just means that you found one, and the likelihood of that happening, especially given Francis Bacon's involvement, is very high, because that's a part of language, there's a lot of content, and there seems to be dubious influence there 
uh, to particularly put extra numerological significance into the text. There's also a small sample size, which is something we talked about previously, because the calculations that are done on these things are only done on the KJV. People aren't doing them on other Bibles. People aren't doing them in other translations in other languages. They're not looking at all the parchments, all the manuscripts. And so I bet you could find numerological proofs in Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, even though they're horrible quality compared to, let's say, the Byzantine manuscripts. I bet because the, the Sinaiticus and, and Vaticanus are complete. They're more complete than the other manuscripts, so there's more content. So I bet you you could find some numerological significance. Does that prove that those things should be, you know, the better ones to, to go with? No, absolutely not. This is the, the train of logic. Imagine if other texts can demonstrate the same thing, which so far we've shown just a little bit, and we'll show some more. And again, if you use the same standard of judgment, then you would have to say that those texts are inspired because they have meaningful numer numerological patterns. Is that our standard of judgment for something being inspired? Is that it has numerological proofs? It's nonsense. Which, of course, all of this boils down to the third point, which is subjectivity. This is all subjective, folks. The meaning of numbers is arbitrary. You're using the Western counting system compared to other counting systems. And, of course, gematria is occult nonsense. It is completely subjective. God never gave you a list of what numbers mean, and he never told you to look for numbers in the Bible as proof of his sovereignty and his harmony and, and the, the truth of the message. It's nonsense. This is why all this stuff is just not the standard that you should be using. It's mysticism. The Bible does not need these things to be validated, folks. God's word is true because of archaeology. No book has ever been proven by history as the Bible has. Consistency. There are dozens of writers over 1,500 years, one consistent story, all the correlations we looked at, the 60,000 cross-references, the typology, how Scripture authenticates itself, Bible prophecy, historical evidence proves that the Bible is predictive, and it's the only book that has that power. The Quran doesn't, the Talmud doesn't, the, the pagan texts don't. The Bible is unique in history because of its Bible prophecy. Of course, it also has eyewitness testimony through the things we talked about, like undesigned coincidences, embarrassing details, martyrdom. There's manuscript evidence, 99%, 1%. You know that by now. And of course, the claim, the claim about what we need as a, about the human condition and about how to reconcile ourselves with the Creator. The claim, the claim is true. The claim of the Talmud is not true. The claim of the Quran is not true, verifiably. The claim of the pagan texts are not true because they lead you to destruction. They lead you to a works-based salvation, which is impossible if God exists the way that nature reveals him to be. If God exists the way that nature reveals him to be as a perfect judge who is perfectly moral, cannot be bribed because he knows everything, if that God exists, which he does, as a result of his works that you can clearly infer without any text whatsoever, then the claim of the Bible is the only one that addresses that problem. Do you see how the Bible is authenticated just by proof, by, by truth, by, by empirical and also logical evidence. So you don't need numerology. You really don't. The devil is always trying to distract you into physical, obvious things to destroy your theology and, of course, to discredit you and to mock you to the people who need to be evangelized. Because, again, people who are atheists will see people who are KJV only us and say, wow, that whole Christianity thing is just ridiculous. They're just as superstitious as the Catholics and all the pagans that they talk about. So the devil discredits you to the outside world, and it also discredits you to the inside world by ruining your own, your approach to theology and, and Bible study. So don't fall for the trap. Now, why do people get so easily sold by these things? What's going on here that makes these things so seductive? And again, you have to rip away from how you feel about numerology and numerological patterns and the harmony that it seems that, wow, look at all these cool patterns, and realize that your mind and your flesh are deceiving you. Nature is beautiful. Nature is very beautiful and harmonious. It's an, ex it's an extension of God's character, who is beauty, who is harmony. But the flesh is deceitful. The flesh is wicked. 
There are many psychological principles that you need to become familiar with to understand not just what's happening here with the KGV only numerological proofs, but just in general so that you're not deceived. And we're going to go over them. The first one's apophenia. And this is on Wikipedia. Apophenia is the tendency to perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things. The term yada yada was coined by psychiatrist Klaus Conrad in 1958 uh, on a publication on the beginning stages of schizophrenia. He defined it as unmotivated seeing of connections accompanied by a specific feeling of abnormal meaningfulness. He described the early stages of delusional thought as self-referential over interpretations of actual sensory perceptions as opposed to hallucinations. Apophenia has come to describe a human propensity to unreasonably seek def definite patterns in random informations, such as can occur in gambling. We'll look at that as well. Apophenia can be considered a co commonplace effect of brain function. Taken to an extreme, however, it can be a symptom of psychiatric dysfunction, for example, schizophrenia, where a patient sees hostile patterns, for example, a conspiracy to persecute them, in ordinary actions. Apophenia is also typical of conspiracy theories where co coincidences may be woven together into an apparent plot. Yeah, the PSYOP is that it's a PSYOP. This is exactly what they've done to the public. They have trained you so hard by giving you a little bit of truth about the deep state and about the dark that they have now transferred everybody into the counter narrative successfully with Trump winning and with everybody flipping to the right and to the d delusion that is coming. They have successfully transferred you into another delusion, into another deception, because they know that once they train you enough and give you enough little little nuggets, you start seeing meaning in everything, and you see the meaning that they want. This is psychological warfare, folks. Psyop. Paraidolia. A common example is the perception of face within an inanimate object. The headlights and grill of an automobile may appear to be grinning. People around the world see men in the moon. People sometimes see the face of a religious figure in the piece of toast or in the grain of a piece of wood. There is strong evidence that psychedelic drugs tend to induce and, or enhance paraidolia. A lot of people, by the way, who are into the idea that the mountains used to be giants and they're fallen giants and they're petrified. This is the whole, you know, it's in the flat earth community, especially also like Tartaria, I think, has some of this stuff too. But people fall for this all the time. Here's an example. This is the organ player in uh some cave you can look at it let's see so you kind of i mean yeah i mean you, you look at it your your mind is telling you oh look it's a face but then you look in a different direction and it looks totally not like a face so we tend to see these meaningful patterns in reality it doesn't mean that they're actually that that's an actual face it's somebody that used to be a giant or somebody carved a face there no you're just seeing things because your mind is programmed in a certain way to see patterns Paraidolia usually occurs as a result of the fusiform face area, which is the part of the human brain responsible for seeing faces, mistakenly interpreting an object, shape, or configuration with some kind of perceived face-like features as being a face. Gambling. Gamblers may, re may uh, imagine that they see patterns in the numbers that appear in lotteries, card games, or roulette wheels, where no such patterns exist. A common example of this is the gambler's fallacy, which we'll look at. Statistics. Epiphenia is an example of type 1 error, the false identification of patterns in data. Hmm. It may be compared to a so-called false positive in other test situations. Finance. The problem of epiphenia and finance has been addressed in academic articles, more specifically within the world of finance itself. The examples most prone to epiphenia are trading, hello crypto, structuring, sales, and compensation. If you've been involved at all in the crypto world, you know exactly what I'm talking about with apophenia in trading. Oh, look, it's going up. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. Oh, no, it's not. You just lost, you know, a million dollars or whatever. So this is this is what it is, folks. This type of stuff is wild right now. It is The world is on fire with apophenia and people finding meaning in something that's not meaning, inherently meaningful. Gambler's fallacy. The gambler's fallacy, also known as Monte Carlo fallacy or the fallacy of the maturity of chances, is the belief that if an event whose occurrences are independent and in identically distributed has occurred less frequently than expected, it is more likely to happen again in the future or vice versa. Really quick pause. This is what the lottery is based off of and what gamblers are addicted to. Meaning, let's say you, you have an odds of 1 out of 10 to win a particular slot machine, which is it's a lot more than that, but let's say 1 out of 10. And you've played the, lot, the slot machine nine times. 
Okay? The gambler's fallacy is, if I play again, that's 10. It's got to be a win. It's got to be a win. When in reality, every single time that you play that machine, the odds are 1 out of 10. It doesn't change the odds, the fact that you've played it and you haven't won yet. This is the gambler's fallacy and how they get addicted because it's a, an apophenia. It's, it's, seeing, it's interpreting patterns in, in numbers where there are no patterns. The odds are still the same every time. Of course, they're rigged against you. And some people win when they win because the house lets it happen, lets it, you know, kind of flood. So just to give people a win. So they think, oh, you see, it confirms, it confirms my idea, but really it doesn't. Apophenia is at work and you're being deceived. Moving on. The fallacy is commonly associated with gambling where it may be believed, for example, that the next dice roll is more than usual, more than usually likely to be six because there have recently been fewer than expected number of sixes. The term Monte Carlo fallacy originates from an example of the phenomenon in which the roulette wheel spun black 26 times in succession at the Monte Carlo Casino in 1913. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Gambler's fallacy is, is just another one of these fallacies to show you how the brain is deceived. Very, very important. You know, the, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart, which is really the mind in, in Hebrew, is desperately wicked. Who can know it, it says? Who can know how wicked our minds are? And of course, they are wicked. That's why you need a savior. That's why you need God's will to supplant your will, which is limited, with his unlimited free will and give you the ability to choose the good. The flesh is wicked. We all have the flesh and we're battling with the flesh every day. We're battling with our ego. We're battling with the conditioning that we've had since a little kid. We've hit, we're battling with the trauma. We're battling with the... Um, Heuristics, if you know what those are, they're basically mental shortcuts that your mind always takes to conserve energy, but most of the time they lead to, you know, poor judgments. You're, you're battling with all the psychological, psychological phenomenon. You're battling with this stuff all the time, folks. The flesh is the sum of all of these things against you. That's why you have to evaluate the evidence. Actually, you have to be empirical. You have to be patient. You have to weigh both sides. You have to look at what the data says. Sample size, am I being subjective? Are there any fallacies going on? You have to be really screen everything because the enemy knows exactly how to deceive you. He knows exactly how to push you off balance, how to appeal to your fallacies, to your heuristics, to your psychological triggers and manipulate you. So you have to walk the narrow road and be sober minded. That's what it means to be sober minded, to be awake and not be deceived by your own flesh, the world or the devil. Now back to Wikipedia, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one's prior beliefs or values. People display this bias when they select information that supports their views, ignoring contrary information, or when they interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing attitudes. Does this summarize to you the KGV-only movement and specifically the numerological proofs? Yes, it does. The effect is strongest for desired outcomes, for emotionally charged issues, and for deeply entrenched beliefs. Biased search for information, biased interpretation of this information, and biased memory recall have been invoked to explain four specific effects. Attitude polarization, when a disagreement becomes more extreme, even though the different parties are exposed to the same evidence. Belief perseverance, when beliefs persist after the evidence for them is shown to be false. Take a note, if you're a KGV onlyist, if you still believe and persevere in your attitudes after this presentation, if you're still here, the irrational primacy effect, a great a great reliance, a greater reliance on information encountered early in the series. Illusory correlation, when people falsely perceive an association between two events or situations. All of these are going on in your mind constantly, folks. You have to be sober-minded. A series of psychological experiments from the 1960s suggested that people are biased towards confirming their existing beliefs. Later work reinterpreted these results as a tendency to test ideas in a one-sided way, focusing on one possibility and ignoring alternatives. Explanations for the observed biases include wishful thinking and the limited human capacity to process information. Another proposal is that people show confirmation bias because they are pragmatically assessing the costs of being wrong, rather than investigating a neutral scientific way. That's what it's about. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to let this go. I don't want to let this comfort and this emotion and this tradition go. I don't want to let that go. I don't want to be wrong. So I'm not going to walk the narrow road and evaluate the evidence and base my beliefs on what the evidence says. Flawed decisions due to confirmation bias have been found in a wide range of political, organizational, 
Financial and scientific contexts. You're not immune. Science is not immune. Math is not immune. Politics, finance, none of that is immune. The flesh is the flesh, folks. These biases contribute to overconfidence in personal beliefs and can maintain or strengthen beliefs in the face of a contrary evidence. For example, confirmation bias produces systematic errors in scientific research based on inductive reasoning, which is the gradual accumulation of supportive evidence. Similarly, a police detective may identify a suspect early in an investigation, but then they may only seek confirming then may only seek confirming rather than disconfirming evidence. So you, you pick somebody and you, you don't really base it on evidence, but you want to just now find the evidence to confirm your beliefs. A medical practitioner may prematurely focus on a particular disorder early in the diagnostic session and then seek only confirming evidence. In social media, confirmation bias is amplified by the use of filter bubbles or algorithmic editing, which display to individuals only information they are likely to agree with while excluding opposing views. Isn't that the truth with today's social media phenomenon? Is there something I highlighted here? I don't think I did. I think that was it. But confirmation bias, you should know what that is. It is very active in the world. Selective attention. Selective perception is a tendency to not notice or more quickly forget stimuli that cause emotional discomfort and contradict prior beliefs. For example, a teacher may have a favorite student because they are biased in in-group favoritism. The teacher ignores the student's poor attainment. Conversely, they might not notice the progress of their least favorite student. It can also occur when consuming mass media, allowing people to see facts and opinions they likely will they like while ignoring those that do not fit with particular opinions, values, beliefs, or frame of reference. Doesn't that ring true with the Trump movement and trying to wake up your friends about the whole situation that's coming and they just don't want to buy it because they're so emotionally invested in what they like while ignoring the poison that's underneath. Psychologists believe this process occurs automatically. It does, folks. This is part of your flesh. This is part of your mind. Your mind is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked is the mind, according to the Bible. And of course, that's true. Cognitive dissonance is another one. I mean, all these are cognitive dissonance based, but this is information bias. Information bias is a cognitive bias to seek information when it does not affect action. This is going to come in handy as well with this whole KGV only numerological proof. An example of information bias is believing that the more information that can be acquired to make a decision, the better, even if that extra information is irrelevant for the decision. Example, a female patient is presenting, a symptom, presenting symptoms and a history which both suggest a diagnosis of globoma with about 80% probability. If it isn't globoma, it's either popitis or flopemia. Each disease has its own treatment, which, it's, which is ineffective against the other two diseases. A test called the ET scan would certainly yield a positive result if the patient had popitis and a negative result if she had flopemia. If the patient has globoma, a positive and negative result are equally likely. If the ET, if the ET scan was the only test you could do, should you do it? Why or why not? Many, subject answered, many subjects answered that they would conduct the ET scan even if it were costly and even if it were the only test that could be done. However, the test in question does not affect the course of action as to what treatment should be done. Because the probability of globo globoma is so high with a probability of 80%, the patient would be treated for globoma no matter what the test says. Globoma is the most probable disease before or after the ET scan. In other words, they have no reason to do the ET scan, but this is the information bias. Oh, we need to do it. We need more information. In this example, we can calculate the value of the ET scan by considering 100 patients of which 80 have globoma. Since it is equally likely for a patient with globoma to have a positive or negative ET, ET scan result, 40 people will have a positive ET scan and 40 people will have a negative ET scan. The remaining 20 patients have either papitis or uh, flopemia. Out of those, the 10 patients with papitis will have a positive ET scan while the 10 patients with flopemia will have a negative ET scan. Thus, out of the 50 patients with a positive result 40 uh, for globoma and 10 plus papitis, 80% have globoma. Likewise, out of the 50 patients with the negative result, 40 and 10, 80% have globoma. The probability of globoma is therefore entirely unaffected by the result of the test, regardless of how it turns out. The test can provide no information that would affect the decision to treat the globoma, so it should not be carried out. Why is that information bias relevant to this discussion? Well, how it works is the following. The more numerology correlations, quote-unquote, I can find the more it proves the KJV is divine and special. The more information we can just pull at this thing, the more we can say that the KJV is inspired and authentic and, you know, original 
uh, originally from God, and so on and so forth. But the number of correlations is subjective. There are many in all translations, as you saw in the previous example, and you'll see again in some other texts as well. The Bible as a whole and other translations have many correlations. And of course, the number of correlations doesn't affect or guarantee perfect doctrine for the people who read it. You see, the, again, the therefore in parentheses. You got to watch out for the therefore in parentheses, folks. No, you could have an, a million numerological proofs of the KJV. Is that going to guarantee that when you pick up that book and you read it, that you're going to get perfect theology? No, it's not. It's really not. So, therefore, the number of correlations, i.e. the information, does not affect action. It doesn't affect your beliefs. It doesn't affect the truth. It doesn't affect theology. Therefore, this is an information bias, because you're saying, oh, I need more correlations to prove this Bible is true. No, you don't. That doesn't do anything for your actions. The actions, just like with the example we read previously, um, with the you know hypothetical medical example, it doesn't affect your actions. The test that they were running does not affect the actions. You still have to treat the patient for that particular globoma disease. I don't know if that's a real disease. Maybe it's a fake disease, but either way, you still it doesn't affect your actions. Whether the KJV has more numerological proofs than other translations or other languages or whatever else doesn't affect the fact that you have to read in context, use consistent principles, use other sources like history, um, you know, not be biased, check yourself for biases, understand apologetics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These actions do not depend on you getting more and more numerological proofs from the KJV. They don't. So there's a problem with this, thinking that you need to get this information. It's completely inconsequential to the actions that you have to take. But this is what the devil does. The devil gives you something that is so enticing and so sedu seductive so that you don't take those actions, so that you get a little low-hanging fruit, you munch on that, and your stomach gets full, and you don't hunger for the true food, which, of course, is all of these deeper things. And by filling your stomach with low-hanging fruit, you actually never develop yourself, and the devil can cut you off from evangelizing other people successfully and destroying your own theology and drifting you into legalism. So, this is how these things work. And remember, again, the KJV has errors. It has errors in it, folks as you saw, hopefully, and, and you see it for yourself. And the KJV is still used by many people to produce very bad fruit and very bad theology. So the numerological proofs have no effect on action, and they're inconsequential. The other thing is this. Patterns exist everywhere, folks. They really do, and we're going to document them now so that you see for yourself. This is from... Uh, Philosophy, phil philosophy, philosophy, philosophy stack exchange. How probable is the philosophical significance of numerical patterns in religious texts? I have a Muslim friend who told me about a chapter in the Quran in which he claims there is a numerical miracle. This chapter is unique in the Quran because a particular part repeats frequently. The first occurrence of this is in the section number 13. If we collect the numbers of these sections, they form a sequence. And it gives you the sequence. If we concatenate these numbers, we get the long number such and such is a very long number, which is divisible by seven. Hmm. Reversing this number from left to right or from right to left, we get the following number, which is also divisible by seven. Would you look at that? Similarly, we, conco we concatenate the numbers in the list from left to right. We get this number, which once again is divisible by seven. Up to this point, everything seems to be merely a trivial random occurrence. It's akin to finding patterns in a set of random data, a phenomenon known as the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. We'll read about uh, that as well. And despite not being Muslim and holding no belief in God, particularly in religious contexts, I was surprised to learn that the number seven holds significant value in the Quran and in Islam, as well as Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, and even in nature. Hmm. I've also, some, I've also come across information suggesting that numerous other patterns in the Quran exhibit similar features related to the number seven. So what is the probability of such phenomenon occurring by chance? My concern is that we could arbitrarily choose any number, such as eight, and attempt to find patterns or connections in Quran to correlate with it, falling prey to the same Texas sharpshooter fallacy. And there's some good responses here. Apophenia describes, among other things, the human propensity to see questionable patterns in random data. That, in a nutshell, is what basically all of this numerology is. The basic process tends to go like this. 
look at data from every angle you can think of, perform a whole bunch of arbitrary operations, use different numerology, number mappings, consider different translations or parts of text, i.e. chapters, etc. When you find something interesting looking, you say, wow, this is so unlikely, someone must have specifically put it here. It must be magic. The probability of finding this specific pattern is the wrong thing to consider because it may as well have been some other pattern in some other chapter using some other method. What is the significance of this very specific combination of one, considering the position, two, of the specific repeated phrase, three, within the specific chapter, four, concatenating the positions, and five, dividing the result by seven? If there's no specific significance, then one could have found any other pattern, and they'd say you'd roughly guaranteed to find something that seems unlikely sooner rather than later in pretty much any text. You'll see, there's plenty, plenty of examples in other texts. Also, even if we grant that it's exceedingly unlikely to find this pattern in the text, and that is noteworthy rather than just being a result of the fact that rare events happen all the time, so what? If this is supposed to be proof that a deity inspired the book, that would be a deity with a very weird sense of humor. You see what the what the unbelievers respond to this and how, de how the devil uses this to discredit you in the face of unbelievers? So do not use these things as proofs, so folks. The unbelievers will see right through it. They're, they're not, they had, they're deceived in their own way, but they're not, you know, many of them are not deceived on these types of things and they'll see right through it. I suspect an all powerful DT can do something at least a little more impressive and extraordinary than putting some words in a few thousand year old book in some particular order for people to notice at some point. Not only is the basic methodology of numerology complete nonsense, they typically also try to draw conclusions that make absolutely no sense given the evidence. Exactly. That the KGV is the anointed book of God when it has errors in it. Putting all this aside, text certainly isn't just random data, and this could count against numerology. If one finds a pattern, that may just be a pattern that exists in writing generally, particularly in the same language written around the same time for the sim similar purposes. It would be pretty mundane to claim that patterns exist in human writing. One could perform similar analysis on other texts to see in similar pa if similar patterns exist. Although I don't expect this to account for too many instances of found patterns, as the patterns typically seem quite arbitrary. The bigger problems are those mentioned above, i.e. the scattershot approach of numerology and the questionable conclusions drawn from found, uh, from found patterns. There's no one, the other one here too. It says, I grew up Muslim and remember reading a lot about these patterns. They confuse me just as well. First of all, because Islam has so many rituals that involve numbers such as saying certain things three times or 33 times every day, I suspect it sort of puts you in OCD in an OCD-like state where you start seeing patterns everywhere. This is primarily the reason why you'll often find Muslims focus on these kinds of things much more than other religious people nowadays. Well, I don't know. The KGV only, sir, are definitely competition. But I digress. Ultimately, once you realize that these kinds of patterns find mechanisms, pattern finding mechanisms aren't specified in advance, this becomes unremarkable. I could open a book and think of a million ways to try to search for a pattern, and sooner or later I will find interesting ones. It's just that most people don't actually do this, and when they do, they notice similar patterns. See assassinations foretold in Moby Dick, which we will look at. Presumably, you don't think Moby Dick predicts assassinations, and yet it does. It will not by not it would not by intent, but you'll see that these patterns happen in profound ways. The real and more fundamental problem with this, and something that I missed growing up, is that God isn't any less of a coincidence than whatever coincidence you're trying to explain. In order for a particular pattern to be explained by God, there must be an agent with all the right properties needed to explain it. Why would reality contain a God with all of the right properties to explain a particular event instead of anything else? How is this any less coincidental than simply stating that reality was simply structured in a way to result in that pattern without design? The same point is missed by the fine-tuning argument. Design requires a designer. In every single instance of design where we felt justified to do so, we already knew the designer existed. Such is the case of humans or even beavers. Design in inferences help us distinguish between what designers do and what designers don't once we already know what, that they exist. We, when we don't, we, can, we can't make this inference, inference. So the point is, look, there's probably some aspect of reality that is harmonious in language and there are mathematical patterns because you'll see over and again that there, this happens everywhere, not just the KJV. Let's read about the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. The Texas sharpshooter fallacy is an informal fallacy which is committed when differences in data are ignored, but similarities are overemphasized. Confirmation bias. From this reasoning, a false conclusion is inferred. This fallacy is the philosophical or rhetorical application of multiple comparisons, problems, and statistics in apophenia, 
in cognitive psychology. It is related to the clustering illusion, which is a tendency in human cognition to interpret patterns where none actually exist. The name comes from a metaphor about a person from Texas who fires a gun at the side of a barn, then paints a shoot, the shooting target centered on the tightest cluster of the shots and claims to be a sharpshooter. Yeah, so you're finding the evidence to support your conclusion, basically. Now, let's look at assassinations foretold in Moby Dick. The following challenge was made by Michael Drosnan, who is the author of The Bible Code. Quote, when my critics find a message about the assassination of a prime minister encrypted in Moby Dick, I'll believe them. Newsweek, June 9th, 1997. Note that the English with the vowels included is far less flexible than Hebrew when it comes to making letters into words. Nevertheless, without further ado, we present our answer to Michael Drosnan's challenge. And here they are, folks. Prime Minister Indra Gandhi, you can see how these work. These are, again, you're taking words in Moby Dick, and you're putting them in the same way the Bible code put them, and you have basically these uh, crisscrosses. In this case, the Prime Minister is Indra Gandhi, and you have uh, Gandhi, basically I, uh, Gandhi, in, in a... In a vertical alignment, and then you have in a horizontal alignment the bloody deed intersecting. Look, it's predicting the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Prime Minister Rene Mawad. Here they are. Burst open the door, and you have Mawad vertically across it. Over here you have another one, but it's backwards. Mawad, and then it says an exploding bomb. And then it says R-A-C, or car, backwards. So, you know, you have all kinds of rules. You can go backwards, forwards, so you can pretty much create anything. So Mawad, an exploding bomb in the car, who is, uh, who is assassinated by a car bomb. So all of these things actually happened, and they can be found using the same rules as the Bible code in Moby Dick. Soviet exile Leon Trotsky was executed with an ice pick on August 20, 1940. So here you are, Trotsky... This is vertically, but it's going upwards. And what does it say? Hammer is one word. And then this says the steel head of the lance. The steel head of the lance. And then you have ice right here. And then another one says executed. So you can find meaningful patterns, which of course, these are all by chance. The writer of Moby Dick did not intend to predict assassinations. Of course, these aren't predicting. They're just words that are semantically related to these executions, and they're being correlated just in the same way that the Bible Code authors are correlating words that they find to things that happen in history. The Reverend Martin Luther King, he was assassinated. Well, let's see what this says. This says T-E-N-N, -N, uh, Tennessee probably, or what, I'm guessing, it was fatally shot in Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee on April 4th. So this is T-E-N-N. -N. Then you have... Uh, King backwards, ML King, but it's, you know, uh, upwards. Then this is to be killed by the, to be killed by them. And then gun in blue, U-N-G-U-N, -U also in more spacing letters here. And then you have pr uh, prepare for death <laughs> underneath that. So you've got also, I think this one says uh, U.S. agent deed, an agent deed or something like that. So you have all sorts of these messages. There's all of them. Chancellor Eg Egelbert Dolphus. You can look at these yourself. Assassin Sirhan Sirhan. Look at all these in Moby Dick. This is Moby Dick. John F. Kennedy. You can see this is uh, Kennedy backwards. This is K-E-N-N-E-D-Y. And these are all spaced out, again, according to these certain rules. This is death, D-E, or D-A, yeah, A A E. Uh, D A A E H, D A E H, something there. Um, S H O T, shot. Oh, D E. This is head backwards. This is H E A D. So shot is brown. H E A D, head. So Kennedy, shot head, and then this is had been so killed. So this is supposedly pr predicting Kennedy's assassination. Same rules. Same things, and you can find all of these. Look at this. All these meaningful, quote-unquote, meaningful things. Abraham Lincoln, Yitzhak Rabin. Same as the Bible Code. You can verify the above passages and find your own using the public domain text of Moby Dick. It can be downloaded at, and they give you a link here. See Some more information about the pictures can be found here. 
Princess Diana's death. The death of Lady Diana was also predicted by Moby Dick. See the Princess Die page for details. A note to the credulous. It has come to my attention that people have taken this page as claiming that Moby Dick really predicted the assassinations of famous people. Please be assured that none of these patterns happened by all other than pure random chance. No laws of probability are violated here or even stretched a little. That is also true of Drosnin's book, which is the whole point of the passage. Once you learn Drosnin's rules, which are none, and the method, a bit of a messy programming, you can find things like this anywhere. The reason it looks amazing is that the number of possible things to look for and the number of places to look is much greater than you can imagine. Yeah, there's so many rules about how how many letters you can space and, and the content is so large that you can find all sorts of things. And of course, this is not actually predicting these assassinations. Do you notice? It doesn't say the, the time and the date. It just says certain words that are very similar to these events and, and through the mind, you can correlate them and say, oh, see? And, and by definition, the, K, the uh, KJV only definition, well, then, then the Moby Dick book must be inspired because it's predicting the future. Of course, it's nonsense. These are just numerical patterns. Here's another one from our favorite little Muslim apologist, Lily J. Let's see if we can turn the sound on here. Hey, ChatGPT, I have a question. Can you please read the Quran for me and tell me how many times the word angel and the word devil is mentioned? In the Quran, the words angel and devil are equally mentioned 88 times. This is often seen as representing a balance between good and evil forces. That's interesting. What about the words man and women? Man and woman are each mentioned 24 times, symbolizing the balance and equality between them in the eyes of God. What about life and death? 145 times. And heaven and hell? 77 times. Wow. What about love and hate? 26 times each. Wow. And this is all meant to be a coincidence and written by an illiterate man? These intricate patterns in the Quran, written by an illiterate man, are seen by many as clear evidence of divine authorship rather than mere coincidence. My mind is blown. What do you guys think? Hey, ChatGPT. What do you think? What do you think when the Muslims, who are a harlot daughter of Rome, who are antichrist in their religion, I'm not saying, I'm not accusing anybody specifically, but Islam is antichrist. They're part of an antichrist false prophet religion. It's a harlot daughter, and we talk about that in my Did the Catholic Church Create Islam video, so check it out. But what do you make when people are arguing the same way as you, KGB Onlyus, that look, our text has all of these numerical things and it shows that there's balance and harmony and therefore it's an anointed thing by God. Do you see the problem? Here's another one. Some examples of mathematical analysis applied to Talmudic study. Jonathan Rosenberg. I'm not going to go too much into this, but we're going to read just a little bit. This is, thus this particular Hebrew word speaks both of the value of mathematics in and of itself and of the value of applying mathematical analysis to Talmud study. I certainly don't want to claim that the latter should be the normal way to study the Talmud, as is in fact only applies to a few isolated words. But if we are to take the idea of such and such seriously, then we should entertain the idea that mathematics, even serious mathematics, might sometimes have some useful things to say about Talmudic study. So I would like to consider three examples. And he breaks down these very elaborate, excuse me, examples in the Talmud and how you see all these math equations and blah, blah, blah. And how math is in a line. You got even some charts here that show you that, look, yeah, all these things are true according to math, and you got some sacred geometry and all of this stuff going on to basically tell you that math is proving the Talmud. So there you go. The Jews are up to it, just like they used to be. The meaning in details, the meaning of the details, Talmudic numbers. This is another thing too, an essay. You can read it for yourself, but there's studies on this. This is by Rabbi Yitchak Blau. The rabbis have been doing numerology and Kabbalah and uh, divination and gematria for hundreds and hundreds of years. Here's another one. This is Electronic Journal of Vedic Studies, Volume 12, 2005, Issue 3. Number Symbolism in the Vedas by S.S.N. Murthy. We'll read just a little bit of this. Numbers became very sacred to all cultures since the time man started feeling the need to use numbers in daily life and started observing that the events related to the nature cosmos had preference for certain numbers. Thus came a stage when mathematics started evolving along with philosophy. All the activities ultimately led to the evolution of the modern numerology uh, system, the credit for which goes to Pythagoras. There's our friend Pythagoras again. 
During this process, all cultures independent of each other had shown preference for certain numbers in their religious beliefs and activities. Similarly, in the Vedas, too, one finds numbers such as 1, 3, 7, and 10 as the most used numbers, at least on a few hundred or perhaps even more than a thousand occasions to describe various events. The symbolism associated with the single-digit numerals was very well established in virtually all cultures since counting began on the ten fingers. Uh, for more general reading, yada yada, and for symbolism in the Vedic context, the reader may refer to such and such. The Vedic rishis also used large compound numbers like 21, 33, 34, 99, and 100 very frequently, which were previously explained in the trans translators of RV to mean many. But no serious attempt has been made far to see whether there is any hidden symbolism in these numbers. Because of lack of information on this front, there is often confusion or lack of agreement among the scholars in the interpre interpretation of the verses. One interesting case, which has become subject of heated debate in recent years, is the Vedic verse referring to the sacrifice of horse, which gives an outward impression that the ribs of the sacrificial horse are 34 in number. Rajaram quote the above verse to identify the Vedic horse with the native horse, which is said to have the same number of ribs. Witzel has hotly contested this on the grounds that the usual horse has 36 ribs, not 34, and since the sacrificial horse is a symbol of the heavens, the numerical symbolism has a role to play. In the same set of hymns, blah blah blah, of certain verse numbers, this is mentioned, uh, or of three, six, 360 days and 12 months of a year, where it appears that we get the meaning of the numbers in a straightforward manner. This observation adds some more confusion to the entire discussion, as in one case, the former the number has a symbolic meaning, and in the other, it does not. The suggestion of some scholars that these hymns could be a later edition also does not solve the problem. The answer to this puzzle, in all probability, also lies in num numeral symbolism itself. Hence, a necessity has been felt to see the meaning and the ideas of the Vedic rishis in, in the use of compound numbers in their verses. I completely agree with Witzel that the, num the numeral 34 does not correspond to the ribs of the sacrificial horse, and the number symbolism has a very major role in that context. This statement is based on my analysis of the compound numbers used in the Vedas, the details of which are given below. So, what's the point of documenting all of this, folks? The Jews, the Muslims, the pagans, everybody uses the same stuff. They all see patterns in numbers, they all see patterns in their sacred texts, they all see symbolism in their sacred texts through numbers, and of course, the question of the day is this for KJV onlyists. If you are a KJV onlyist, and you are still clinging to this idea that numerical significance is in the KJV, here's the million dollar question for you folks. What makes you different from all of these other antichrist groups? How do you distinguish yourself? Because each one of them has the same arguments as you and has the same empirical evidence. The Quran has tons of numerical patterns in it and, and you know, whatever else. And according to them, well, we have an inspired book. That's a problem for the KGV only movement because you have now made the same argument that the enemy is making. And of course, the thing that makes the Bible unique is something that the Quran can't say. The Quran doesn't have Bible prophecy. The Quran doesn't have archaeological proofs. The Quran doesn't have all the things that the Bible has. 1,500 years and countless witnesses and eye testimony and historical proofs and undesigned coincidences and all of these things that prove the Bible is different than any other revelation in history because those things are counterfeits. So that's the problem. Nothing makes you different from the pagans and from the Antichrist groups. This is how the devil discredits Protestantism through the Antichrist spirit, by making you lower your standards to everybody else, and therefore, to people who are unbelievers, discredit you. To your own, you're going to focus on fleshly things and ruin your study skills and eat low-hanging fruit instead of eating the meat. And of course, ultimately, deceiving people through ecumen ec ecumenical efforts too, because these things can be used from an ecumenical perspective. Look, we all have numbers. We all have things in our sacred texts. Maybe God, maybe there's one God for all of these religions, and he's just revealed himself in different ways. Do you see the ecumenical point that these things could be used? So again, the Bible calls us to be holy, folks. Set apart. Don't be like the world. If you see all the other Antichrist groups doing all this numerological stuff, and you see somebody telling you that, oh, look, the Bible has these numerological things, that means, therefore, it's true, then you should reject that. Sure, does the Bible have numerological things? Sure, but the consequence is meaningless. That's not why the Bible is good or true 
or validate or validated through history or preserved by God. So these are very important things because, you know, just like with the um, modern charismatics and speaking in tongues, I talk about this in my Great Delusion series. If you compare modern charismatic expression with Kundalini, and there are videos online that compare one and one, you can just look at both of them at the same time and see, oh, okay, same thing, counterfeit Holy Spirit. La, 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 la. The Kundalini people do this too. They shake and they laugh and they speak in gibberish. There's literally no difference between the Kundalini false Holy Spirit of the mystery religion and the charismatic movement. It's the same thing. What makes you different? If you're claiming that God is working through you, that the Holy Spirit is doing something, what makes you different than the pagans? Well, I'll tell you what makes you different. When speaking in tongues actually happened, God gave them the ability to speak in foreign languages immediately, without error grammatically, without error in pronunciation, supernaturally. And there was flaming tongues over their heads. And they could be understood perfectly. That was a supernatural event. It is documented that speaking in tongues as this supernatural event where you could spontaneously start speaking in a foreign language and you need an interpreter, which by the way, none of these people ever have because it's just all gibberish and nonsense. That miracle disappeared by the first century, by the year 60, before the destruction of the temple, because it was designed just as an early little spark to get things going, supernatural stuff, just like with Peter putting his hands on people and raising from the dead, or Paul doing the same thing. These things died out. They weren't designed for the length of the church. And people today are obsessed with signs and wonders, but the question again comes back to this. What makes you different than the pagans, than the mystery religion? If nothing makes you different, and they are doing the exact same things, but they're calling it something different, then you two are being guided by the same Antichrist spirit. If the pagans, if the Muslims, if the Jews, if the Indians, if all of these people are saying that we have numerological symbolism in our texts, and you can find all these patterns, you can find the predicted assassinations in Moby Dick, then your argument of numerology in the KJV, you could have a million numerological proofs. It is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. So this is the problem, folks. What makes the Bible true is that it's prophetic and it's validated by history. We know that already. There is countless psychological biases that the devil will use to deceive you, and you need to be aware of them. That's what it means to be sober-minded. You need to be aware of your own flesh and the tendencies of your own flesh and how the devil can use those things to deceive you because he will, he will use anything at his disposal. And if you have an imbalance, if you hold to, to tradition, if you're an emotional thinker, if you're easily baited by you know beautiful things, the devil knows that. He knows the human condition, and he will destroy you with it. He will devour you. So be very careful, and be sober-minded, and study to show yourself approved. This is why you need to build your foundation on all of the things we've talked about. Critical thinking skills, reading in context, using hermeneutic systematic theology, multiple pieces of evidence, history, building a case, making sure you delay your decision until you have enough information. All these things are important not pseudoscience. So what do we make of these patterns in the KJV? Well, remember that the are there are many issues with statistics and math, and there's a lot of psychological biases, like I mentioned. Remember that numbers are subjective, so it doesn't it doesn't mean anything that Jehovah is written seven times. What does that mean? What what conclusion does that mean? Is that something that you can infer to take action on? No, you can't. It's just a pattern. It's meaningless. Remember selection bias, ignoring everything that doesn't fit your criteria and selecting only things that do. For every single pattern that is found in the KGV, I guarantee you there are countless that are nonsensical. And of course, they only present to you the ones that are. So that's, that's the selection bias at work. Remember things like Moby Dick and the assassination. So ultimately, you take it with a grain of salt. Could there be a general harmonious nature to language itself? I think so. I think probably because, again, math is harmonious, physics is harmonious, the, the laws of the universe are harmonious as a reflection of God. So it would stand to reason that language has an unseen harmony to it, 
to be able to produce this phenomenon because it's obvious that this is a phenomenon in multiple languages, in multiple places. Arabic produces these things. English produces these things. The Vedic, you know, Sanskrit or whatever they write in produces these things. So everybody's able to produce these things, meaning language inherently has some harmonious aspect to it. God is the word, right? So he created language and words. So I think that that's a reflection of him. But that's not exclusive to the KJV. Could the Bible have patterns because God is perfect and he revealed himself and therefore there has to be some sort of harmoniousness to the information? Maybe, maybe, absolutely. I, I'm not uh, going to discount that. But again, with all of the counter evidence that we've described, you take it with a grain of salt. Even if this is the case, it's not theologically meaningful, nor should it be used as proof for your beliefs or for the particular translation that you use or for the Bible in general being true. That is the last thing you should be using. Please do not use this as a proof, especially with people who are unbelievers, for the Bible being true. Please do not. Because in the end, what matters is you can trust that God's word has been preserved. You can trust the translation that you have for all of the reasons we've covered. There is empirical and logical proof for the Bible, which we've covered as well. And the Bible is unique in history because it's true. That is what matters, folks. You need to know why the message of the Bible is true. And again, to me, it's the simple things that matter. Nature reveals to you that you are dealing with a sovereign God who is perfectly just and cannot be bribed and knows everything. He's the author of morality, so he's perfectly good. Looking upon your own life, you realize that you have many, many sins against this being. You don't need the Bible. You don't need numerological proofs. You don't need to, need to even know any evidence. Just look around you, as Roman 1 says, so that you are without excuse. Look around you and you realize who God actually is. The God of Judaism, the God of Catholicism, the God of Islam, the other false gods that the pagans believe that is not the true God. And that is why they are deceived with synergistic ideas. Because if they actually discerned from nature, from the works of God, who God actually is, as sovereign, completely just, completely moral, etc., etc., very easy to discern. If you actually discerned who God actually is, they would abandon their religion. They would see, wow, there's no way I can pay for my sins. There's no way I can work for this. I need a solution. Is there anything in this world that solves this problem of God being just and my sins need, being, need to be forgiven without me dying? Is there anything that can solve this problem? And then the good news shows up and says, yes, the problem has been solved by a man named Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, who paid the price, the ultimate price, to both redeem God's name as a judge, because his death was infinitely valuable, so it proves that God is perfectly serious about sin. Romans 3, 21 through 26. And also provided a way, a legal way, for God to give his Holy Spirit without compromising his righteousness, because the sin has been paid for. So now his Holy Spirit can be given, and you can receive forgiveness of sins and a new life, and to be resurrected. There's a legal way to do that now because of Jesus' death on the cross. That is what you need to know. Everything else I covered, like undesigned coincidences, martyrdom, historical proofs, Bible prophecy, archaeology, all the things we looked at, co uh, typology, co uh, co um, references, those things are important to understand apologetically. But the thing I just told you about, from natural revelation to the gospel, you don't need the Bible, you don't need to be a Bible scholar, you don't need to memorize all these things. You just need to look outside. Because outside, if you're honest, reveals to you the truth. So I hope that has been edifying for you. Onward now to the epilogue with some final thoughts. 